Okay, hello everyone. My name is Dmitro Hileshko, and in today's weekly paper review, I will introduce you to a paper titled Neural Angelo High Fidelity Neural Surface Reconstruction, published by all of these brilliant and beautiful people from NVIDIA Research and John Hopkins University. So, Neural Angelo is a framework for high fidelity 3D surface reconstruction from RGB images using neural volume rendering. The methods of neural surface reconstruction are somewhat similar to NERVs, but they prefer using functions like occupancy grid and SDFs for better defined 3D surfaces in order to aid uh, future surface uh, recovery. Unfortunately, with the current methods, the quality of recovered meshes does not scale well with the capacity of MLPs. And to deal with that, some works uh, use auxiliary data, such as uh, depth and segmentation. And other works uh, use structure for motion as a guiding mechanism. Uh, this paper, so, uh, Neural Angelo, uh, does not require any auxiliary data and promises results that uh, significantly surpass uh, previous works. Uh, here is how it looks. So, Neural Angelo samples 3D points along camera view direction, uh, encodes the position, and those encoded P features are input to SDF multilayer perceptron and the color multilayer perceptron. Uh, unique features of this approach is the adaptation of multi resolution hash encoding, the use of numerical gradients, and a cars to find optimization strategy. We will go over all of these features in later slides, but for now, uh, let's see some more general information, starting with uh, SDF. SDF stands for sign distance function, um, and SDF of any given point X is the sign to orthogonal distance to the closest surface. And the sign is determined by whether or not X is inside or outside of the surface. Uh, the surface of an SDF can be represented by a set of points x where SDF value of x is zero. Uh, to allow for a nerve like optimization, a opacity estimation formula is used. So nerves uh, represent the scene as a volume density and color fields. And given a set of points that were sampled along a ray direction, the rendering, rendered color is uh, calculated using Riemann sum. That's the formula in the black bounding box. Uh, in simpler terms, the rendered color is a weighted sum of colors uh, predicted along the ray direction. And the weights uh, depend on the opacity, which in turn uh, depends on the predicted density. In our case, we have no density values. Uh, instead, we have SDF values, which are distances to the surface. Uh, so given a 3D point and then SDF value f of x, the corresponding opacity value alpha i can be estimated as a, a difference of sigmoids of SDF values of two consecutively sampled points divided by the sigmoid of SDF value of the current point. Uh, this way, when two points are far from any surfaces, uh, the value is close to zero. And when the points are close to the surface or even on the opposite sides of the surface, the value tends to be 1. Uh, this uh, opacity estimation uh, lets us compute rendering loss in a similar fashion to NERV uh, while using a better representation for future surface, uh, surface extraction, so uh, SDFs. Uh, in truth, the RGB loss is only one of three components uh, of a complete loss function. Uh, the other two uh, are the econal loss and the curvature loss. Econal loss comes from a special property of SDF that a derivative of SDF value is a surface normal with a unit length. And by using this loss, we enforce neural representation to be a valid uh, sign distance function. And the curvature loss is used to encourage the smoothness of the reconstructed surfaces. Uh, during optimization, both MLPs and the features that are stored in the hash entries of multi-resolution hash encodings are trained jointly. Uh, 
one more thing about the loss function is uh, the weights, uh, in particular the curvature loss weight. So following prior works, uh, the authors initialized the SDF as approximately a sphere. And with this initial shape, the high curvature loss makes concave shapes difficult to form because it preserves topology. Uh, so instead of applying curvature loss from the beginning, a short warm-up period is used that uh, linearly introduces this kind of loss. And the authors also stress the necessity of using this loss function. Uh, so here on the figure, we can see that uh, without curvature loss, the surfaces tend to have uh, sharp transitions. And, uh, well, and without topo topology warm-up, the uh, concave shapes are uh, difficult to form. Now comes the fun part, starting with the multi-resolution hash grids. Uh, so um, each hash, uh, so multi-resolution hash grids uh, st store features in the hash entries, and each cell corner is a, is a hash entry. Um, so given a set of uh, different spatial grids, uh, the input point xi is mapped to a uh, is mapped to the corresponding resolution. Uh, so xil is xi times vl, and then at each uh, grid resolution, the feature vector is obtained by a trilinear interpolation of hash entries of grid cell corners, and a complete feature vector consists of a concatenated features from different uh, grids from different resolution grids. And then this uh, complete uh, feature vector is passed to a shallow uh, multilayer perceptron. Uh, so like in he here an example, the point X, an input point X, uh, its uh, features are uh, created from interpolating the hash entries at grid cell corners. And a problem with direct directly applying multi-resolution hash grids with SDF representation is that uh, analytical gradients of hash encodings with respect to position are not continuous across space under trilinear interpolation and suffer from localities, meaning that for point X, uh, only the correspond only the local grid cell is updated during backpropagation. And if there are uh, continuous flat surfaces like walls, uh, those uh, all of those grid cells should produce um, smooth surface without sudden transitions. And to ensure this uh, consistency, uh, the joint optimization of these grid cells is desirable. Uh, however, with analytical gradients, uh, unless all of the corresponding uh, points at the corresponding grid cells are sampled and optimized simultaneously, such consistency is not uh, guaranteed. So the authors propose to uh, use numerical gradients to overcome the locality of analytical gradients. Uh, on the downside, it requires us to sample six more points. So given the point xi, we sample six more points along x, y, and z axis with some step epsilon. And on the bright side, it allows us to simultaneously update adjacent grid cells for any given point x. Thus, it becomes a smooth version of analytical gradient. In practice, this step size epsilon is not chosen at random. Uh, it is initialized to the cell size of the lowest resolution hash grid. And during the optimization process, the epsilon is slowly decreasing. Uh, so this decrease in epsilon together with progressive activation of grid cells forms a cars to find optimization strategy. So when the training starts, only an initial set of cars hash grids are enabled, and as the epsilon becomes smaller, the finer hash grids are activated. Uh, the authors state that if all hash grids were activated from the start uh, and we were using numerical gradients, then the higher resolution hash grids would have to learn uh, the same cars features because of this high epsilon step. And then in the later stages of the optimization, as the epsilon becomes smaller, the finer hash grids would have to unlearn and relearn new features to capture finer details. And 
uh, this relearning uh, can be unsuccessful due to uh, convergence, convergence issues resulting in loss of geometric details. And here is the visualization of surfaces during optimization as uh, finer and finer grids are enabled and learned. Uh, regarding dimension locality problem, here is the comparison. So, analytical gradients cause coarse surfaces to contain artifacts. Uh, while using numerical gradients leads to a better coarse shape, details are also smooth. And the final, uh, final solution with numerical gradients and uh, progressive activation of grid cells uh, produces both smooth surfaces and fine details. Uh, as we can see, the proposed framework achieves either the best mm -hmm. or the second best uh, results on a multi-view data set. And uh, on average, it is the best. Uh, here are some quantitative comparison on an outdoor and an indoor scene. Uh, so the, the first row is the input, the bottom row is the proposed solution and comparing it to other solution, it does have uh, much higher fidelity and it captures a lot more details. Here are some more examples on some objects and a building. Um, and it looks great, so enjoy it become, because now comes the least fun part and that is the requirements. So Neuralangelo with its default configuration requires 24 gigabytes of GPU memory uh, fortunately, there are official, even legal ways to handicap the framework to fit it inside 16, 12, or even 8 gigabyte GPUs. Uh, secondly, depending on the scene, training can take anywhere from a couple minutes to multiple hours. Uh, I, tried it, I tried running it twice. Uh, the first time on a toy example, the Lego bulldozer example, and it took me about 30 minutes to get a nice mesh. And the second time I recorded an, recorded an object myself and let it train for about five hours. Unfortunately, it turned out that the camera poses were off. So the mesh, well, there, there was no mesh. Uh, and that is the third point. It requires very accurate camera poses. So call map recovered poses may not just do it. Uh, in conclusion, the authors presented Neuralangelo, a framework for neural scene reconstruction that naturally incorporates the representation power of multi-resolution hash grid encoding into neural SDF, improves the quality of surfaces by using numerical gradients, and uses cars to find optimization with a progressive level of details retrieval. That's all. Thank you for your attention.